she's at <laughs> she's at Yale University Sandy Springs branch um, where she's uh, worked for many years and her focus is on um, treatment of substance use disorders which include opiates and stimulants and alcohol and she's going to talk to us today because the rumor has it that we see several patients who are plagued with that those disorders at least that's what I hear so um, Sandy it's good to have you here no matter where you're from be it Sandy Springs or New Haven Thanks, Mike. I know I was on the airplane coming down and the airplane icon on the flight indicator was partially covering, I guess, in Sandy Springs. And I thought for a minute it said Sandy Springer. And I thought there's some direct message to me and how awesome. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I didn't know. Atlanta's awesome. No. Um, <laughs> it's a personalized welcome. Um, so thank you. I'm an infectious disease physician, um, but have always uh, actually went into infectious disease um, and specifically to treat patients with HIV because of my interest in substance use and seeing in the early epidemic as I was growing up in the medical world and medical school, patients dying alone in the Northeast um, with a uh, plague with heroin predominantly and cocaine use disorder dying from HIV, I'm very stigmatized. and. So it's always been very important to me to integrate and hopefully um, treat the whole patient. So I have a tough job. I have to talk about all three substance <laughs> use disorders in 30 minutes. I'm going to try to do that, but they could. Um, these are my disclosures. Am I too close? Is it echoing? That's the height. Yeah, that's a better. And the learning objectives, which are in your um, syllabus, but really just identify, knowing how to identify substance use and substance use disorders in our patients who are at risk as well as living with HIV. And I hope if you don't now, that maybe when you come away from this, there might be an interest in potentially um, uh, feeling the understanding and the, and the need for us to be able to treat um, these substance use disorders. And uh, the other thing I'll just briefly touch on is really things that have been really echoed throughout this whole session is um, patient preference, really meeting people where they're at, and also thinking about other things besides just medications that we need to do. So this is my outline. So I don't have enough time to go into all the epidemiology, but I'm sure you're very familiar with our current uh, drug epidemic um, in this country. We can't forget the early one, right? Um, but initially it was fueled by prescription opioids in the late 1990s, this current one, but really is just uh, markedly related to synthetic opioids, you know, really starting in 2013. However, in Connecticut, where I'm at, fentanyl was really in, around much earlier than that. Um, but that's really driving the overdose deaths um, across the country, as you can see in this um, dark line. And just from the 2020 to 2021 period, we saw over 107,000 individuals die from drug overdoses. And that was about, um, uh, in, for synthetic opioids, a 22% increase. Heroin, on the other hand, dropped about 32%. And that's predominantly because the supply is really just overwhelmed with um, synthetic opioids. We cannot forget that we also have a stimulant epidemic that also on their own stimulants can cause death, um, including cocaine, which has been around for a long time. It's the main drug in Connecticut um, in the dark blue line, but you can see also around 2013 started to see a spike in deaths. And, and importantly, psychostimulants like methamphetamine with a 33% increase in deaths just from 2020 to 2021. And if I was to show you 2022 data and early parts of 2023 data, the deaths are still going straight up. And similar to what we know from the early HIV epidemic here in the United States, as well as elsewhere across the world, and people who use drugs, inject drugs, it shouldn't be surprising that with those um, increases in drug overdose deaths, and drug, which is showing increase in drug use, that we're seeing um, increase in new 
HIV epidemics across the country, and this is not um, completely exhaustive. I just want to show you some of them. Um, and uh, starting with the or original one in Scott County, Indiana, which was um, started with a prescription opioid uh, epidemic related to um, oxymorphone use. I know I'm hearing this a little follow-up. Um, but importantly to know that in Medicaid and non-Medicaid expansion states, we're seeing new HIV epidemics occurring among people who inject drugs as well as use drugs. And, the, and, and not just through drug use or sharing in drug, drug use um, equipment, but also through condomless sexual intercourse. And I could go on and on about this, but just to, to be um, aware. And we had another outbreak in 2021, right when the epidemic started in Boston, that I don't have represented here as well. Also acute hepatitis C cases and other um, bacterial infections, across, including endocarditis, that are really just all increasing. This is just a summary slide that you're all very familiar with, but really emphasizing the point that we know that drug and alcohol use, and there's actually data for nicotine as well, can increase the likelihood of risk of obviously acquisition of HIV, but among those who have HIV also interfere with the HIV treatment care continuum, um, leading to decreases in antiretroviral adherence, increases in viral load, and obviously more increased morbidity to the individual but from a public health standpoint, if we can't suppress HIV viral load and people are partaking in sharing injection drug use works with condom sexual intercourse, we have increased um, HIV uh, transmission. And so when we're thinking about the ending the HIV epidemic plan, right, which the goals are to test everybody, provide rapid antiretroviral therapy, or PrEP based on test results, and among those who have HIV, achieve viral suppression, if we don't really think about how we're going to identify and integrate substance use disorder identification and treatment, we're never going to reach those goals. If we look at data from the CDC and look at viral load suppression rates here in blue, um, based on risk categories, injection drug use, I'm still hearing that echo, I don't know if you guys are hearing that too, um, that we're not anywhere near the 100% viral suppression rates that we should be achieving to reach a 90% reduction in new HIV cases by 2030. So let's start with a case. Um, and this will illustrate some of the identification and treatment issues. So you have a 46-year-old gentleman who was admitted to the hospital for fever, chills, back pain, found to have methicillin, staph aureus, bacteremia, endocarditis, epidural abscess, and also HIV. He started his antimicrobial regimen. He's also having significant pain, so he's on morphine. Surgery seeing him to uh, debride his epidural abscess. You also start antiretroviral therapy, and you identify that he has an opioid use disorder. What's the next best step? Refer him to a methadone clinic upon discharge. Offer him in the moment buprenorphine naloxone combination tablet or, or on film prescribe uh, long-acting or extended-release naltrexone, or none of the above. He's still on morphine for pain control. Oh, I don't get my head pop. <laughs> I asked for it. <laughs> Thank you. I won't jump, though, for you. <laughs> All right, yeah, so great. Um, so this like tells me that a lot of you are experienced perhaps in treating with buprenorphine. Can I have a show of hands of how many people actually prescribe or treat opioid use disorder prescribe buprenorphine? Not a lot. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> but hopefully we'll increase that. So uh, briefly, what we call expert screening, brief intervention, and I put the extra I, initiation slash referral for treatment for substance use disorder can be a very effective in all settings. So harm reduction programs like syringe service programs, jails, prisons, I do a lot of work there. And then in our hospital settings, emergency rooms, in, when they're in the hospital, your primary care HIV clinics all can work. So when we're thinking about screening, we're trying to identify what's called a substance use disorder. It's no longer abuse 
or dependence, and we use the Diagnostic Statistical Manual at DSM-5. And what you're trying to do is identify what uh, symptoms. And so there's 11 symptoms here. I've um, uh, divided them based on what their categories are, loss of control, social problems, risky use, and the pharmacological problems, including tolerance and withdrawal. Um, but that can be hard for you to remember. Um, so there is, uh, just a note, any two or more of those symptoms um, equates with a substance use disorder. It could be current or past. And then there's severity, divided by mild, moderate, and, and severe. And why is that important? Moderate to severe is the indication for medication treatment for opioid use disorder. So if I was seeing a patient, I would want to know in the moment, do they meet criteria for moderate to severe opioid use disorder so I could start them on buprenorphine? Or past history for someone maybe coming out of a controlled environment like prison or jail or from a hospital setting where they might not be using and there's a risk of relapse and I might want to start them on treatment. So there's a whole host of screening tools, but I can tell you, as you probably know as well, they're not universally used in all our settings. It's very rare to see patients routinely screened for opioid and other substance use disorders. But one that you should consider um, is the National Institute on Drug Abuse, or NIDA, quick screen, and then I'll show you the reflex to what's called the assist. Um, it can't, it's free, and you can integrate it with your electronic medical record and it will skip out based on substance use, and you get, can get a severity score. The other one I'm just going to talk about is one that I created, the Rapid Opioid Dependency Screen, and then there's others, as you can see here. But just to demonstrate the quick screen, it's just a one question. It's like in your lifetime, or it could be the past year, as it's stated here, have you ever used prescription drugs for non-medical reasons? And they also, unfortunately, use the term illegal drugs. But if there, it just says once, that's an automatic concern for a substance use, in this case, opioid use disorder, we'll say, and it would automatically have you go through the whole um, assist. The other one uh, I was just going to point out, uh, the rapid opioid dependency screen, the reason why I created it was way back when, when, I, um, when buprenorphine was just FDA approved for non-licensed treatment um, people like me in my HIV clinic and for people coming out of prison and jail so that I could identify did they have what used to be called opioid dependency so I could immediately start buprenorphine? This is for non-clinicians or clinicians, and you get a score of three or more, and, you, and it tells you at that time it was opioid dependency, and we've also just validated this for the DSM-5 um, for moderate to severe opioid use disorder. So the medications. We have three FDA-approved medications. They all work. They all reduce craving for opioid use, they all reduce use, they reduce overdose, and they reduce death. The main issues, as we know, um, are there a different activity at the mu opioid receptor. So methadone is a full opioid, buprenorphine a partial opioid, and extended release naltrexone is a pure antagonist, like long-acting naloxone. Um, and there's differences in where you can prescribe them, right? Methadone, you and I can't, unless we're in an opioid treatment program, cannot prescribe methadone for the treatment of opioid use disorder. Um, but buprenorphine and extended release naltrexone, you could. Um, the issues are that for patients who are actively withdrawing or might have a pain condition, you'd only be able to use uh, buprenorphine. And buprenorphine is the most effective treatment. It actually reduces mortality by over 60%. So we really should be considering this. In addition, there's many formulations of buprenorphine. There's the sublingual tablet, sublingual film. There's an implant, talking about implants of antiretroviral therapy. There's a six-month implant, uh, um, probuprene, And there's um, an injectable form in the abdomen called, right now called sublocate. And there's another one that's coming out soon called Brixati. Um, and, and it lasts for a month. And these formulations can be used in a hospital setting, justice setting, your clinic. You know, we're thinking about all these long-acting forms of PrEP and antiretroviral therapy to think about that as well. And I'm going to show you some data how they can also improve HIV treatment outcomes. So one of the questions I always get is how, um, you know, are they in withdrawal or they're not? So first, treatment of opioid use disorder, you could be treating acute opioid use and opioid withdrawal. 
but you could also be trying to prevent use, so they may not be in withdrawal. So a setting like coming out of prison, they're not actively using, but we would like to start them on a form of treatment to prevent relapse. The number one cause of death of all individuals who are released from prison and jail is overdose, regardless of how long they've been incarcerated. <clears throat> so it's really important to identify, screen, and treat. So how do we, but if they ha are an individual like this gentleman that was in the hospital who's at risk for withdrawal, we want to be able to identify that. And also it'd be important to start buprenorphine treatment. Um, so this is just the clinical opioid withdrawal scale. You guys can download it on your phone. It's free. It's a simple scoring. And you get the severity down below there in um, mild, moderate, or severe. Anything five or above, if they're actively using, you can start buprenorphine. So that's, that's really important to know. How do you do it? I don't have enough time, but it's super easy. And this is how I started. I got my X waiver way back when. Now you don't need it. No longer need the X waiver. You guys are all aware of that now? How many are aware of that? Okay, good. Um, but you do want to be careful if somebody's actively using. You want to be able to predict if they are in withdrawal or they're going to go into withdrawal. And right now with fentanyl, the withdrawal can occur really quickly. And the old way we used to do it is start buprenorphine and then over maybe a two to three day um, period, get them up to a maximum of 16 to 24 milligrams. But now in the age of fentanyl, you probably are gonna try to do this all in one day. And we do this in the hospital, maybe 16 to 24 milligrams in the first day because the withdrawal is uh, occurring much faster and it's much more severe. But you can, you can monitor them, right? You can do the clinical opioid withdrawal scale, see if their withdrawal is coming down, monitor them, and keep going up. Then there's something called low-dose transitions now because patients might be on a long-acting opioid or for this, like this patient on morphine for pain or fentanyl. And so I, I don't have time to go into this, but there is a safe way to initiate buprenorphine in patients on methadone, patients on morphine, other treatments, so that you can get them onto a safe dose um, quickly. And we um, have a study currently that's also in a case report showing how you can do this, and I don't have time to go into that, but it's a, a, and a whole other subject. I think one of the key points I wanna make is there's so much concern or people are scared of precipitating withdrawal that there's a delay. In any delay, in a patient who is in that moment reporting an interest in use is potentially an increased risk of death for that patient. So if somebody is interested, you can start treatment. Now, it may not be that minute because you're, but you can start talking about treatment. Hospitals are a reachable moment that we really need to be using more. And that could be for PrEP, other things, but definitely for substance use disorders. The big thing is um, you don't need to have in the moment in your clinic behavioral treatments before you initiate medication treatment. The key is to start medication treatment first, assess if they need those, and also think about other things that we need to do, like screening for hepatitis C and other things. Liver function tests, EKGs, all this stuff, you don't need that before you start treatment. It's very safe. I've published on this. Others, people with HIV, hepatitis C, starting um, treatment is, is not uh, increasing their, their um, liver toxicity. And also, really importantly, other associated needs, housing, transportation, other substance use, psychiatric conditions, um, get help, have a multi, um, uh, you know, team that they might have a, a additional um, uh, guidance for you, but these are all important services that we need to think about. I don't have a lot of time, but I, since we are at an HIV um, uh, uh, educational program, I did want to say what I what I did I, when I went into this um, uh, my infectious disease fellowship. I was really interested. I didn't think there would be a difference, right, in people with HIV starting buprenorphine versus those. Um, not with HIV, all who have an opioid use disorder and opioid treatment outcomes. What I was interested in is can we show that if we treat their underlying substance use disorder or prevent substance use, could we also improve HIV treatment outcomes? 
And this was um, an early study right after buprenorphine was FDA approved. No one had heard about it. It was all individuals with HIV coming out of prison and jail, mean incarceration period, about a year. And they came and their cravings were pretty high at the time of release. And they started a, a new treatment to prevent use. And one of the things I was interested in was, would the treatment of buprenorphine improve their likelihood of maintaining or achieving viral suppression? And so that's what we found. Those in green who started buprenorphine and stayed on buprenorphine compared to those in orange who did not stay on buprenorphine compared to those who chose no buprenorphine were more likely statistically to have a viral suppression at less than 50 copies at uh, six months out. But this was not the quintessential double-blind placebo-controlled trials because there could have been other things. So we later did that. With the newer, new kid on the block, which at that time was the first injectable form of treatment of opioid use disorder, extended release naltrexone, same population, uh, like I said, double-blind placebo-controlled. And we found the same thing if we could treat the underlying risk of relapse opioid use disorder um, for this population coming out of prison and jail, we can improve their likelihood of maintaining and achieving viral suppression, which we did here. So I'm, I'm going to go to the next question. Uh, you're providing care for a patient with newly diagnosed HIV and opioid use disorder. They express strong motivation for starting treatments for both. Um, and uh, you're considering starting buprenorphine with ART. And so the question is about um, concern about drug-drug interactions. If recommending an NC to use concurrently with bup, which strategy to manage potential drug-drug interactions is indicated? Reduce the buprenorphine dose. If you're going to use, hopefully not, but l and cobisistat, increase dalutegravir to twice daily if using with bup, increase bup dose if using with bictegravir or dalutegravir, or no dose adjustments are needed when you're using any of the NCDs with buprenorphine, or you're just not sure. Yay! All right, good. So the bottom line is there's no drug-drug interactions with buprenorphine. Believe it or not, this was a big concern, and so there was a reason for hesitancy a lot in providers for not treating. Similarly, I, I had another slide for hepatitis C, DAAs. There's no drug-drug uh, interactions also for bup, so just, just to be aware. So I don't have a lot of time to go talk more about opioids, but I could. So alcohol, much more common, right? Um, and again, similarly, we don't screen enough for alcohol use disorders, and there's high likelihood of increased risk of not only liver toxicity, but we can also see other toxicities um, in our patients. And it does increase risk behaviors in those who don't have HIV, well, in those who have HIV and don't have HIV, so also considerations for pre-exposure prophylaxis in those who test negative. Um, when we rarely see offering PrEP, um, and also concerns um, for initiating treatment of alcohol use disorder in patients with HIV because there's this fear of liver toxicity. But I can just say that I've published on this and others that treatments for alcohol use disorder don't increase the risk of liver toxicity in people with HIV on antiretroviral therapy and with active hepatitis C. So let's think about screening for alcohol. Very simple question. I use it. It's on the NIAAA's website. Um, all you have to do is have they ever had an alcoholic beverage? And then how many times in the past year have you had, I would just say, four or more drinks? And if they say yes, that actually is a good predictor of hazardous or what we call harmful drinking. That one question. And then that can reflex to what's called the audit C, which is a three-item question. And you can see there's a score that will tell you the likelihood of having hazardous drinking. And then there's the full audit free um, by the World Health Organization. And you can get scores and give you that severity of likely what we used to call alcohol abuse and dependence now alcohol, severe alcohol use disorder. When you think about treatment, um, the goal, actually, for alcohol use may not be abstinence for some. It may be what we want to do is decrease to what we call low-risk drinking. So that's really talking to patients. Maybe there's an increased risk, um, uh, say, for an individual that was presented. Oh, no, not here. In another another um, uh, program, sorry. Uh, that had, was increased risk of sexual risk. And um, 
you know, talking about that, you might want to say, let's, you know, maybe our goal is to do, decrease the amount of alcohol so that we don't put ourselves in risky situations and obviously thinking about prep. Um, but we also have to think about, excuse me, um, the concern for withdrawal. So for alcohol use disorder, as well as other benzodiazepines, that withdrawal increases your risk of potentially death. So if they have a history of withdrawal symptoms with delirium or seizures, that would not be somebody that you could treat immediately in your clinic setting. They would need to go into an inpatient detox facility. And we also have to think about other behavioral treatments like cognitive behavioral, 12-step programs can be very effective for individuals. And these are our medications. So we have four medications FDA approved. And naltrexone and extended release naltrexone are the most effective treatments for alcohol use disorder. They can decrease craving and use, and they're safe to, to use in somebody who's actively drinking. Um, so you can have an injection, extended release naltrexones in the buttock once every four weeks, and oral naltrexone. Problems with oral naltrexone are you can, they have more side effects, so they don't really stay on the treatment. And then there's a campersate. Unfortunately, it has to be taken three times a day, so there could be poor adherence. And then uh, disulfiram or antabuse, which you have to have high um, monitoring because of increased um, toxicity like VFib. But I will also say that with alcohol use disorder, similar to opioid use disorders, we can see if we treat that underlying alcohol use disorder in individuals with HIV, we can also improve their HIV treatment outcomes. So the ending the HIV epidemic goals, again, like I mentioned with opioid use, we want to help individuals um, achieve and maintain viral suppression. And here, this is another double-blind placebo-controlled trial that we did, um, again, using extended-release naltrexone, FDA approved for alcohol use disorders, and people with HIV coming out of prison and jail. And viral suppression was the primary outcome. And we achieved that um, between groups as well as within. So placebo, no difference. Naltrexone improved viral suppression rates on less than 50 at six months. So this is another question. I'm going to move to stimulants. This is why I'm telling you. It's like, I could, I could go on an hour for each um, substance, but I don't have time. So we're going to switch to stimulants. Um, a 46-year-old man with HIV and opioid use disorder, he's doing well on his um, medication treatment for opioid use disorder, MOUD, uh, which is buprenorphine. But he reports that he was using um, occasional stimulant use, maybe smoking cocaine um, every once in a while. But now has started using methamphetamine and is injecting multiple times a week. What would be the appropriate next step? Stop his MOUD, so stop his buprenorphine, he's not using opioids. Um, or stop his um, buprenorphine offer on contingency management. Or switch his treatment of opioid use disorder to extended release naltrexone or continue and offer, uh, continue it and offer contingency management. Due to time, I'm just gonna move forward. Yeah, so thank you. So why would we stop his buprenorphine? It's doing what it's supposed to. He's decreasing his opioid use. Extended release naltrexone, yes, there was a study with bupropion for methamphetamine, but it's not FDA approved in the, um, we could argue about its clinical um, implications. I'm not gonna go into all this, but you can use that same NIDA assist to evaluate for stimulant use disorder. And then just the bottom line, there are no Currently, FDA-approved medications for stimulant use disorder. It's very difficult to treat. However, behavioral treatments like contingency management are the most effective treatments and actually work really well. So Dr. Lennox actually presented a contingency management case with alcohol, so payments um, to reduce alcohol use, but there's other ways to incentivize um, reduced use uh, that do, don't have to be direct payments. But we also have to consider other harm reduction tools, a non-punitive um, discussion, including um, discussing about safe injection procedures, syringe services if they're um, allowed in, in your um, state, drug testing, helping them. So there's lots of areas where they can test their drugs to see contaminants, naloxone for all individuals. And um, I just wanted to point out for the last minute here, xylazine, um, so we're, this is a drug that I'm sure you guys are seeing in your communities, unfortunately. It's used in veterinary medicine as a sedative. Um, and it can show the same symptoms of an opioid overdose.
overdose, but does not respond to naloxone. They may or may not know that they're using it. It's also known as Trank, so people are using it more um, intentionally, but it can be in the stimulant supply without them intentionally choosing it. We still recommend naloxone, but just remember rescue breathing, 911, and you know, really talking to patients about this. So other things, and this is the area where I've been really focusing most of my work now, um, is really helping patients get the services that they need and not expecting them to come to us, but us really finding them. So bringing services, peer patient navigators, mobile health services, going to them, including um, one that I'm developing now, mobile pharmacies, um, telehealth, and, and visiting nurses' home care model. And I would also like to say all these lovely long-acting injectable treatments, including um, PrEP, we really need to think about how we can help offer these to our patient population. And I'll just end with um, the guidelines in the current IAS USA guidelines. There's now a complete section on substance use disorder, and everything I just said is actually mentioned in these guidelines, so thank you. Thanks, Sandy. This is always a hard thing. We got uh, coming up to the microphone. Yeah, we'll start off, please. Do you have a preference um, with uh, buprenorphine, whether it's with naloxone or alone? Some of us are like uh, reticent to give it without the naloxone. So, uh, how do yeah. You think? So um, you can you can do either, but you're kind of um, so sub, the buprenorphine alone is only. Um, it's approved for people who are pregnant. Um, the naloxone was meant for the DEA to deter people from injecting it. So it would, so no, the naloxone on its own does nothing to the person who's taking buprenorphine. But if you were to supposedly inject it, it was supposed to precipitate withdrawal. We don't really know, have enough data to support that. But um, I still recommend suboxone, but, or which is a buprenorphine naloxone product, but they both work. This is a quick follow-up to your uh, inpatient con concept. So, um, let's see, I understand about inpatient uh, in in initiation of buprenorphine, but what if the patient's seen outpatient? Last use of opiate was fentanyl, maybe today, not an active withdrawal. How do you approach this? What's your decision about use of buprenorphine in that setting? So somebody who's in the outpatient setting? Yeah. Yeah, no, um, so there are, you can, uh, to use sublocate, or which is the injectable form, is that the question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, you could. Um, so there's a nice case series, but it was in an inpatient setting with John Mariani and Francis Levin at Columbia, where they took people who were actively injecting fentanyl and gave them sublocate on day one <laughs> without in it. Um, but you could do this in the outpatient setting, and there are patients who are doing it and including no buprenorphine sublingual induction, just giving the sublocate there. Um, you just, the thing is you talk to patients, right? You say that there's a likelihood that, that you're gonna precipitate a little withdrawal, but over time, but as you, um, it'll, it'll stay consistent and uh, blood levels and naturally um, achieve better um, adherence if you can stay and start it then. But a lot of people are scared about doing that. Yeah. What about, this is a uh, question about semiglutide. We talked about that on the panel, but the question is, could it be used for substance use disorder? I, I don't know. Yeah. I you mean, have to be comfortable with saying, I don't know. I don't know. Well, as they get off their fentanyl, they can lose weight. <laughs> that could work. Um, uh, it feels like naltrexone is uh, supplanting um, Alcohol Anonymous in uh, some patients and with problem drinking. Do you um, find that that works well, the naltrexone? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it. I, I mean, I personally don't think it should supplant, like take over um, from other behavioral regimens, but I do think that um, uh, programs like 12-step programs need to be more um, willing to uh, and allow patients um, to be on medication. I definitely, I, so I started out in my HIV clinic treating with a 
instead of release naltrexone and oral naltrexone. Um, and it does, it actually can decrease their craving um, and uh, decrease their use. And people tend to like the extended release naltrexone because it doesn't have the daily side effects like oral naltrexone. And it's an injectable form of medication that they don't have to worry about taking um, every day. So I remember, I don't know, several years ago, maybe eight years ago, there was some uh, approach to use a Dancitron or Zofran yep. for alcohol use disorder, but it had a genetic component that like 40% of people might respond, but uh, what's the status of using Zofran? Yeah, I, I don't, um, the status, I get some people are using it. Um, it's not FDA approved for treatment of alcohol use disorder, but as you know, we use a lot of medications that are off label. I personally haven't used it. Um, but some people, I don't know if anyone in the audience has used it to treat alcohol use disorder, but I don't have a, a current um, opinion about it, I right. say. Let's dig in a little bit because of the announcement yesterday or day before about Narcan being over the counter. Um, I know in our clinic with your colleague, Ellen Eaton, uh, we, pres we give out a lot of Narcan. Almost every time we give an opioid prescription, it comes with Narcan. Um, and what is your approach and what are you, what are you gonna recommend to folks? I know it depends on what the cost is, but uh, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I mean, my, all my staff, all, me, um, all carry naloxone, not just for you know, patients that I'm in, in a clinical research trial or patients, but you just never know a life that you could save. Um, and you, know, you just never know, um, it could be anywhere. And naloxone is in, in intranasal um, and you know, obviously, you always call 911. Unfortunately, in the age of fentanyl now, and also with um, xylazine, you may not be able to reverse it right away, but in some cases you can. But yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm super psyched that it's now over the counter. The big problem, though, is the cost issues. So we um, hopefully will tackle that. And I, I forgot to mention, there's no longer, you, you don't need to get an X for buprenorphine. You guys are aware of that with the MAT and the MAT goal. So all you need, anyone can prescribe buprenorphine if you have a controlled substance license and as of July 1 you'll have 90 days if you never have to take like a just an eight eight um uh, was it eight CME hours just for any substance use just one time in your life if you've never done it and there's no limit now to the number of patients you can treat with bu. so but yeah naloxone everybody should be giving that to everybody because you just don't know what's in your drug supply I mean honestly I mean the commentary I've making for years is that we don't have to take any training to prescribe fentanyl, but we have to take eight hours of training to use buprenorphine, which was just crazy. Well, yeah, and, and I think the other thing is, is also the, the, you know, people being very um, um, hesitant to treat. Would we be hesitant to treat a patient who is coming in with diabetes with, and people having difficulty taking their insulin, so they're coming in with either, um, you know, high glucose and comas, et cetera, yeah. and to say, oh, we're not going to treat you. So buprenorphine, here you have an actual, you know, you, you just reach, you have to always have, um, keep, keep it open. People are, when they're ready, be willing to, to treat them, and you can save a life. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Joe, I'll let you get the last question. Yeah, um, uh, I have quite a few patients that I've taken care of for a very long time that had you know, avascular necrosis of their hips and shoulders, and, and they've been on narcotics forever. And their hips have been replaced, they're, they're, you know, they're, um, and, and I've been trying to wean down their narcotics over time, not stop cold turkey. Does buprenorphine ever fit for people that are chronically, I think, uh, dependent Pain? or mm -hmm. not on? Uh, yeah, so actually there's a lot of programs, including like Oregon Health Science University. Is anyone here from Oregon? No, I don't so, but um, others, programs that are actually using uh, buprenorphine, our, our um, pain management, the VA, other places are using buprenorphine to help patients who have been chronic opioids um, to treat their pain as well as uh, with their underlying, which now we've created uh, addiction for, to opioids. Yeah. Well, thanks very much. Great yeah. coverage of a critically important topic. Thank you. And there'll be Uber traffic from here to Sandy Springs for those of you who are looking for it after the meeting.